right, so welcome back to uh, the afternoon session of our uh, conference on integrable systems. Our next speaker is Arvind Ayer uh, from the Department of Mathematics in the Indian Institute of Science. Uh, and he's going to be talking about alternating sine triangles. And I understand some connection to integrable systems. Yes, yes, there is some connection. That's why I'm here. <laughs> Thanks to the organizers for the invitation. So uh, I want to tell you about a different uh, kind of problem where integrability helps us, and that's in combinatorics. So I'll present to you a counting problem, a combinatorial problem, which was an open conjecture for, which was open for about 15 years or so, before uh, it was finally realized that uh, integrability is the key to the problem. And in fact, integrability via the Baxter approach, which is specifically the six vertex model. So I'll, I'll get to that in a second. So here's the plan. So the uh, motivation for the uh, for the subject comes from these class of objects called alternating sign matrices, which I'll talk about uh, initially, and and uh, then uh, I'll mention symmetric classes of ASMs. Uh, so alternating yes, alternating sign matrices are called ASMs for short. Uh, and there's a special class of ASMs, which I, I'll mention, which which led to our work. Oh, so I should say this is very much joint work with Roger Berend, who's at Cardiff, and Ilza Fisher, who's at Vienna. Uh, so yeah, so this led us to, the sequence of ideas led us to discover a new class of objects for which uh, we were able to, which we were able to combinatorially solve using ideas from this uh, integrability. So, so here's the story. So the starting point for the story is about the 1860s. So, so suppose M is an n by n matrix, matrix uh, of integers, say whatever your favorite ring. Uh, here's the notation that I need. So if i and j are subsets of one th one through n with the same cardinality then M superscript I subscript J will denote the ma matrix where the rows from the set I and the columns from the set J are removed, okay? So it will also be a square matrix of some of the appropriate cardinality. So here's another formula for the determinant which is uh, much less known. Uh, so the determinant of any N by N matrix, you can get from uh, taking that, the same matrix with the first row and the first column removed, taking that determinant, last row and last column removed, taking that determinant, multiplying these two, and from this product, subtracting the product of the determinants where the first row and the last column is removed and the last row and the first column is removed, okay? And you divide by the determinant of the n minus two by n minus two matrix, where the first and last rows and columns both are removed. So how many of you have seen this formula? Uh, Okay, so there is a slight problem with this formula. Can anyone see it? See, your determinant is, a, let's say your matrix contains integers, your determinant is an integer, right? Just by, by any of the other rules that you know. But this could cause problems because the denominator could be zero. So what will turn out eventually, so you can regularize this in some way and make it work. But, uh, but this is a potential problem and there are some ways of uh, uh, fixing this. But in general, this is an issue. So for computational point of view, this is an issue. Okay, so this is an amazing formula and this was discovered by the Reverend C.L. Dodgson in the 1860s. Does anyone know who Reverend C.L. Dodgson is? Yeah, he's Lewis Carroll. So he discovered this formula, yes? What is fractional determinant? Huh? Yeah, if you're, uh, if you're matrices, no, 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 but this is the same determinant, it's just a different formula. If your matrix contains integers, the determinant will be an integer. Yeah, if your matrix contains fractions, of course, it can be a fraction. Okay, so this is none other than the Lewis Carroll of Alice in Wonderland fame. 
So uh, this led some people in the 80s to consider the following generalization, which is called the lambda determinant. So instead of a minus sign, over there you put in a lambda. Okay, for some weird reason they changed the minus to a plus, but okay, it's not my fault. So that's therefore that's the definition of the lambda determinant, and you set the initial condition that the empty matrix has lambda determinant one, and the lambda determinant of a singleton matrix is that entry itself. So just like you have uh, the formula for a determinant uh, in terms of the sum over permutations, it's natural to ask is if there is a there's a like a cleaner formula for this. So, and the answer is there is, and to define, to give you the formula, we have to define this notion of an alternating sign matrix. So what is this? An alternating sign matrix of order n is an n by n matrix whose entries are, z are zero, or plus one, or minus one, such that when you sum across any row and any column, the answer is one. And when you look at the non-zero entries, that is either uh, along any row or any column, you see they alternate in sign. That is, you see a one followed by a minus one, followed by one, followed by a minus one, and so on. Because the row and column sums are one, it will always start with a one and end with a one. In any other uh, sequence, you will see that the row sum will either be zero or minus one. So this is called an alternating sign matrix. It doesn't have to contain minus ones, okay? So one example of alternating sign matrix is just a permutation matrix. So in a permutation matrix, all row and column sums are one, because for the trivial reason that in every row there is exactly, every row and every column there is exactly one one and all the rest are zeros. So permutation matrices are also alternating sign matrices. But they are a very small class of alternating sign matrices. Okay, so, so here are some definitions. So if A is an alternating sign matrix, let n minus of a be the number of minus ones in a. So n minus of a permutation matrix is zero. And inv of a is the generalization of an inversion number for permutation. So it's, uh, you take appropriate products and you sum them. Okay, I can motivate this if you, you can ask me later. So this is a, a generalization of the number of inversions for a permutation matrix. Then the amazing theorem due to Robbins and Ramsey in 86 is that the determinant, the lambda determinant of an n by n matrix M is given now by the sum over all alternating sign matrices of lambda to the power inversion minus the number of minus ones times one plus lambda raised to the minus ones times the product of your matrix entries raised to the appropriate uh, entries in the alternating sign matrix. So remember that AI, AIJ can either be 0, plus 1, or minus 1. So this can either be MIJ, just 1, or 1 by MIJ. So this is a pretty amazing formula. OK? So yes? Yeah, for lambda equal to minus 1, you get the same old answer. No, it will only give 0 when n minus is, yes. So it, that's right, so that's a good observation. So if lambda is minus one, you see this, all these terms will drop out unless A is a permutation matrix and you reduce to the same old form. So you get lambda to the number of inversions, which is minus one raised to the number of inversions. So it, it works out perfectly. So it's a very nice and natural general. So we all know that the number of permutations is n factor, on n, n letters is n factorial. Here you have a new class of objects. So it was natural to cons to ask how many such guys are there? How many alternating sign matrices, n by n alternating sign matrices are there? Are there? And so Robbins did some experiments and uh, through sort of remarkable guesswork, he came up with this conjecture. That the number of alternating sign matrices of order n is this product of factorials divided by this product of factorials, okay? So, uh, this this was uh, this was published in the 80s 86, but this was uh, this had been known before that. So he had been trying to prove it for a while before he actually gave up. So and and just submitted this as a conjecture. Uh, so in finally this was proven simultaneously by two people working in completely different uh, 
from, coming from completely different angles. So Zeilberger uh, proved it uh, using purely enumerative combinatorial ideas. It's a very long 80 page paper with uh, lemmas, sub lemmas, sub sub lemmas and whatever. And it, just the publication of that paper is a story in itself. But uh, remarkably within a year, Cooperberg gave a proof, a much shorter proof using integrability. And that's what uh, I will, that, that's the ideas, those are the ideas that we will use. So the, the sequence uh, starts 1, 2, 7, 42, etc. So, yeah, so for n equals 3, there are all the six permutation matrices plus one extra, this fellow. Okay, so you can see every row and every column ones and minus ones alternate in sign and the row and column sums are R1. Okay, this is the only non-trivial matrix. So I'll need that, so I've written them down on the board to illustrate some points later on. Okay, so here's another digression. Oh, sorry, here's a digression. So in, uh, in combinatorics, uh, there are these objects called plane partitions. So plane partitions, you should think of, one way to think of them is alignment of boxes in the corner of a room uh, where gravity is in the one, one, one direction. So the, the boxes are stacked in that way. So this picture should give you some idea. I'm not defining these things properly, but anyway, this is just a digression. So an, an important theme in combinatorics since the early 1900s has been the enumeration of print partitions. So, so you can ignore these, these two parts, as you can focus on this. So in this picture, the, I have shown you all the possible plane partitions in a two by two by two room. So this is the empty room. This is the room with one box. So there is some, uh, because, of our, uh, because of the way our mind works, you know, the, you can visualize this as either the empty room or the full room, but uh, you know, you, just if you focus, think about it for a minute, that's the empty room, okay, in my convention. There's a room with one box, two boxes in three different ways, three boxes in three different ways, and so on. These are all there are, and you can see how many there are. 16, 20. There are a total number of 20. So, uh, Percy McMahon, who was uh, actually in the English Army, and who was actually stationed in India at some point, after he quit mathematics, he went back and started, after he quit the army, he went back to England and started doing mathematics for a living. And he proved this amazing theorem, which is called the box theorem sometimes. So the number of plane partitions in an M by N by P box for any M, N, and P is given by this amazing product formula. So you take the product from I going from 1 to M, J going from 1 to P, N, K going from 1 to P, I plus J plus K minus 1 divided by I plus J plus K minus 2. There are many different ways of writing this, but well, it's not even obvious that this is an integer, but it is. And uh, so this is the number of uh, plane partitions. So, so this started a lot of uh, interest in combinatorics of this kind. So one natural uh, thing was to consider plane partitions under symmetry. So some plane partitions which are symmetric under some operation. So for example, if you look at all of these, these are all possible plane partitions in a two by two by two box. How many of these are vertically symmetric? In other words, if I take, if I flip the, if about the middle, if I flip the left to right, when is the plane partition invariant? So for this guy, it's invariant. This guy, it's invariant. This guy, it's invariant. This guy, it's not. This guy, it's not, and so on. So the, you can ask how many vertically symmetric plane partitions are. You can also, for example, rotate by 120 degrees. So rotation by 120 degrees leaves the room invariant in some sense. And how many of these are, uh, are so-called cyclically symmetric? So this is, uh, these are the so-called cyclically symmetric plane partitions. And it turns out that many of these have nice product formula, just like McMahon's theorem. Uh, so cyclically symmetric is a particularly interesting case. It was, it was conjectured by McDonald, actually. This was known as the McDonald conjecture for many years. Then it was finally solved uh, by Rump, Mills, Robbins, and Rumsey. 
And there are these other cases, some of which have been solved only recently. So the theme is that uh, if something has a nice product formula, you know, symmetric classes also might have a nice formula. So the amazing thing is that this number of alternating sign matrices that I showed here is actually uh, the most symmetric class of plane partitions. So these are called totally symmetric self-complementary plane partitions. So these are symmetric under uh, under all possible symmetries, rotation, transposition, all those things. In addition, they are self-complementary in the sense that if I flip the room around, replace cells by emptiness and replace the empty things by cells, I get the same partition. So in this case, there is only one totally symmetric self-complementary plane partition, that is this one. If you see, if you flip the box around, then you will see that it's the same. Okay, <laughs> so the uh, it's hard to visualize, but this example should help. So, so make the full box empty and the empty box full. So wherever there wasn't a box, you put a box, and wherever there was a box, you don't put. You remove the box, and you revert invert gravity, and then you turn. It. <laughs> okay, so it's complicated to explain, but it's kind of intuitive. And the amazing thing is that the number of totally symmetric self-complementary plane partitions is the same as the number of alternating sign matrices. And nobody has a good idea why. To which one? Yeah. You've arranged them in some columns, right? Are they supposed to be different symmetry classes? Rows? Uh, no, there's... No, no, those columns don't mean anything. I mean, it's just left justified. So each row... In each row, the number of boxes is the same. I see. But so you, there are three boxes, uh, two boxes in these three, three boxes in these four. In these. Okay. So I, I thought the no, no. most column has got this left right symmetry. Oh, that might be a coincidence. Uh, and you said the right most column is the. Yeah, no, okay. No, 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 no. That was not intentional. No, 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 no. That was not intentional. Yeah, that's a good point. No, that's not intentional. Yeah, it just turned out that way. Uh, by the way, I didn't make these figures either. <laughs> uh, okay, so the amazing thing is that the no total number of self totally symmetric self-complementary plane partitions in a 2n by 2n by 2n box is the same as the number of alternating sign matrices, n by n alternating sign matrices, and we have no understanding why. This, this has been known for at least 30 years, and people have been... so. This is a topic of bijective combinatorics. When you know that two sets have the same cardinality, you want a natural bijection relating the two, and there is none. Okay? It's a wide open problem. In fact, there's one more class of objects, which are called descending plane partitions, which I'm not going to get into for lack of time, which are also counted by the same sequence. So there are three distinct classes of objects which are counted by the same complicated formula, which is this product of factorials divided by this other product of factorials, and we don't understand these things well. So to the point of this talk is that we have one more class. Uh, so we have, we introduce yet another object, which we can prove is counted by the same sequence, but again, we don't have any bijection. So in fact, we are making the story worse in some sense. So, so, so let me explain how we came, how this story progresses. So, uh, so just like uh, there was the study of plane partitions with symmetry, Richard Stanley suggested looking at uh, symmetric classes of plane partitions. Dave Robin started looking at this with nice formulas, and Cooperberg again gave a proof for many of these classes using the uh, using the integrable structure of the six vertex model. So. Here are some classes with formulas. I'm, I'm just sh flashing the formulas before you, just to show you that they are nice. But unlike the plane partition case, not all are nice. Uh, so here, vertically symmetric ASMs. So this is why I drew the picture. So what's the vertically, uh, what's a vertically symmetric ASM? Well, this is the only one. None of the others are vertically symmetric. Uh, vertically and horizontally symmetric, again, this is the only one. Diagonally symmetric alternating sign matrices, which are just invariant under transposition, the identity is there, the anti-identity is there, and this guy is there. 
half turn symmetric, so you rotate the matrix uh, 180 degrees and you get the same matrix. Again, identity is there, anti identity, it's again this fellow. Quarter turn symmetric, you rotate about 90 degrees. Again, you have nice formulas. Uh, the special classes called OS ASMs, which are diagonally symmetric ASMs with zeros on the main diagonal. These have nice formulas, there's no such example here, uh, and so on. So, many of these were, uh, have been, uh, proofs have been coming up over the years. The last one which was open was the so-called DAS ASM. So, these are matrices that are symmetric both about the diagonal and the anti-diagonal, okay? So, uh, the identity is one example, the anti-identity is another example, this, this special ASM here is another example. So this was the last conjecture, and in recent work, uh, which is published in the advances, this has been proved to have this nice formula. Okay, so this is, but only for the odd DSS, and so no formula for even guys are known, even today. Uh, but it's known, it's guessed that they are not nice, because the number of these guys doesn't factor so well. In, uh, so. So it's possible that there's no nice formula. Okay, so here's a non-trivial example of size 13. So I have drawn the diagonal in red and the anti-diagonal in blue. And okay, if you stare at it long enough, you'll find all the symmetry. So this minus one is after, after reflection by the diagonal, this one, and after reflection by anti-diagonal, this one. And you have to check that every row and every column uh, satisfies the alternating sign condition. Uh, so since it's, uh, it's diagonally and anti-diagonally symmetric, all the information about the matrix is encoded in this top fundamental domain. So it's a fundamental region. This is the same. Okay, and now what does it mean for uh, this alternate, how do you interpret the alternating uh, sign condition? Because now you don't have full rows and full columns. Well. You start along a column, and when you hit the boundary, because of the symmetry, you flip 90 degrees, and you turn until you hit the next column, and you flip again, and you reach upstairs. So, any such uh, guy should be, uh, when you read along any such guy, you should, the non-zero entry should alternate in sign, right? That's the, that should happen. So, for example, this one also satisfies this property. Uh, so the first row is just like that, you just read the first row. The first, the middle column you read it down and you, or top to down and back, yeah? Okay, so here are all the DASASM triangles of size five, there are 15 of them, uh, according to the formula, okay, this is proved. So, so now I'll mention what we started doing. So. So we started uh, looking at refined enumeration. So whenever you want to prove uh, in combinatorics, it's a common theme. If you want to prove that some set is counted by a certain number, it is often helpful to refine the problem, to put ad additional statistics and uh, see if you can guess something nicer and simpler. So in our case, we started looking at the enumeration according to the number of zeros on the boundary. So by, by boundary, I mean the, the V-shaped entries at the bottom, okay? So I'm counting how many DAS ASM triangles are there with blah number of zeros on the boundary, okay? So for example, for five, uh, there are seven DAS ASM triangles with two zeros six with three zeros and two with four zeros. So it, just to illustrate the point, here is one of the guys with four zeros, and here is one more guy with four zeros in the boundary. And those are the only ones. Okay, so we, we just did some brute force enumeration, we looked at these numbers, and lo and behold, we find the same sequence on this lower diagonal as the number of ASMs, as the number of alternating sign matrices of size one more. Okay, so it's kind of a miraculous coincidence. <laughs> the number of uh, these triangles with the 
minimal number of zeros on the boundary is the same as the number of alternating sign matrices. The ones with the maximal number again turn out to be a nice number and these turn out to be the number of vertically and horizontally symmetric ASMs of, of a certain size. Okay, so kind of magic, you know, this, these things just seem to appear out of the blue. Okay, then we said, okay, why do we stop at zeros? Let's enumerate according to the number of ones at the boundary. And here again, there's a miracle. The guys with the maximal number are precisely the number of cyclically symmetric plane partitions in an n by n box. Okay, so the, the formulas for all of these are known. I mean, so I can just check that these formulas are correct. But, you know, this does not give us any, any idea why this is true. And lastly, according to minus ones, Again, we find the same sequence of alternating sign matrices on the other boundary. So, um, the number of ASM seems to occur out of left field. You know, we have no idea why this is there. So, for instance, analogous to the seven three by three alternating sign matrices, here are the seven DS ASM triangles with three minus ones. Okay, so. Uh, Okay, so now let, let me just give you some quick characterization of what happens on this boundary. So, so for alpha being either 0, 1, or minus 1, let n alpha of a be the number of alphas along that diagonal. So that is the number of zeros, number of minus ones, number of ones. Then you can easily prove the following bounds. All of these are tight. So the number of minus ones is constrained to lie between 0 and n, number of ones between 0 and n plus 1. Number of zeros have to be at least n and at most two n. Okay, so so the thing that we were interested in is this guy, this sequence. So this is the num maximal number of minus ones. So if you look at the proposition, that means the number of minus ones is n. So we have the following alternative characterization. So the number of minus ones is in a in a this triangle is n if and only if the sum of the, all the entries is the least possible. Equivalently, we can show all of these. Uh, if each column sum is zero, and uh, uh, if you ignore the last, if you ignore the boundary, all the row sums are one. So this led us to construct the following object, which, we, which is the title of the talk. These are alternating sign triangles. What you do is you simply chop off the last diagonal, the bottom, the boundary. You just chop it off. So if you chop it off, you get this object, which is called an alternating sign triangle. What is it? It's a triangular array of numbers uh, where in each row the no of entries 0, 1, and minus 1, each, along each row uh, and each column, the non-zero entries alternate in sign, that alternating condition is still there. All row sums are one. Column sums need not be one because now we have way more columns than rows, or more than double. But when you read from the top, you f always see a one first before a minus one. So, so if, uh, if there is a non-zero entry in a column, it will always you'll always see a one first. So, so here are the, again, analogous to this, guys, here are the seven uh, tri uh, alternating sign triangles of size three. So you see all row sums are one. Some column sums are one, some are zero. But the first entry, as you read from above, will always be a one. So here you see all of these have uh, no minus one, the six guys over there, just like the six guys over here don't have a minus one. And this last guy has a minus one, just like this last guy has a minus one. And you see that the structure is kind of similar. So you think that there is a hope for a bijection, but whatever idea you have quickly fails for n equals four. If you tweak it, then it fails for n equals five. I mean, this, this, is, this is the standard thing that happens. You try to say, okay, if I move this zero from here to here and this zero from here to here, I'll get something, you know, that'll fail uh, very quickly if you do something else. You know, any construction that you will have, conjectural construction, will quickly fail for higher examples. And this is, 
this uh, has been the running story in this in this game uh, in this uh, in this subject anyway so there is no known bijection between these guys and alternating sine triangles and alternating sine matrices even though they look tantalizingly familiar and similar okay okay so we have uh, uh, refined enumeration so results so let mu of a be the number of minus ones in a for an alternating sign matrix and let mu sub delta of t be the number of minus ones in the alternating sign triangle then we have that the number of alternating sign matrices with uh, n by n alternating sign matrices with m minus ones is the same as the number of n by n alternating sign triangles with m minus ones so we have this refinement and from there we get this uh, as a corollary we get the main system. so this is one of our main theorems so let me also mention auxiliary the other uh, results related to the cyclically symmetric plane partitions and um, and the vertically and horizontally symmetric ASMs. So we get these other classes of objects called uh, quasi alternating sign triangles. Here, all the conditions are same as the alternating sign triangle, except that the last row can be either zero or one. That's the only difference. Rows, uh, rows and columns alternate in sign, row sums are one, column sums, again, again the topmost entry is one, blah, 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 except that this, this condition is true. And here we, uh, so here's an example for the two by two case. So here you get a bunch of extra things because zero is allowed in the last entry. Okay. And so here is our result that the number of uh, quasi alternating uh, sign triangles of order n is given by the number of cyclically symmetric plane partitions, which has this nice product. Form. And the last result is uh, for the number of uh, what we call as uh, OOSASMs. Uh, okay, this is not uh, my terminology. I mean, we, we didn't invent this terminology. So this means, uh, okay, so for the DAS ASM triangle, the bottommost entry cannot be a zero. It's not hard to show. But these are the guys where all other entries are zero. So it's everything else is zero. There's a one or a minus one here. And uh, how many of those are there are called O. The set of those are called OS ASMs. So they have two and zeros on the boundary. Uh, and these are all of them for size four. So all, as you can see, all of these guys are zero. So there's six for size four. And this is our formula. Again, uh, there are different formulas. So the, these are, uh, yeah, so, okay, so these guys uh, have this formula, which is the same as uh, the number of vertically symmetric, vertically and horizontally symmetric alternatives. Okay, so let me come to the proof ideas, um, because this, this is an integrability conference, so I should uh, stress uh, connection with integrability. So, so our DSASM triangles are this triangular array uh, of the f where you have two n plus one entries in the first row, two n minus one entries in the second row, and so on. So at each entry, the number of this is not like your Pascal's triangle. At each step, you don't go down by one, you go down by two. And you, so you start with an odd number, and at each, end, at each row, you have an odd number of entries. So each entry is zero, one, or minus one, and as I said, this condition, as you read along this uh, set, uh, in either direction, they alternate in sign, and have a sum of one. So here's this example with this, this guy. Um, of order six. Okay, so to make the connection, we need to go to the six vertex model. So, uh, so what is the six vertex model? Uh, it is a, a model for uh, it's a it's a uh, it's also called the square ice model. So you you imagine uh, at each vertex you have an oxygen atom okay and so roughly this is the story so so you have an oxygen atom uh, you know water so imagine what two 
two dimensional layers of water. So it's connected to two hydrogens, like so. Okay. And it's hydrogen bonded to two other hydrogens, like so, which themselves are connected to some other, like so. Okay. So what this says is that at each, each oxygen is strongly connected to two hydrogens and weakly connected to two other hydrogens. So then this forms this network in two dimensions. And so what is one way to pictureize this? Is to say that, is to put arrows on these edges such that uh, the arrows go towards the oxygen in the, from hydrogen to oxygen in the um, in the actual bond and in the hydrogen bond they go away okay so you can see by continuity it will be the same the arrow direction along each half edge will be the same okay so it will be like this and like this and like this yeah is that clear is the picture clear so what is this amount to mathematically at each vertex, there'll be two incoming edges and two outgoing edges, okay? So if you, there are four edges adjacent to every vertex, there are two incoming, two outgoing. How many are there? Well, four choose two, which is six, hence the name, okay? So this is the six vertex model. At each, locally around each vertex, there can be six possible configurations. That's what it is. Okay, so now, what is the graph on which we need to do our uh, business? So this is uh, this triangular grid graph, you know, which looks like a complicated trishul or whatever, you know, uh, and, and, and fold version of this, n shul, uh, <laughs> or 2n plus 1 shul. Uh, so now we have to assign arrows. So what is the set of configurations on which we are working? So this, on this graph, we assign arrows to each edge, respecting the six vertex condition. So, and we need some boundary conditions. So the boundary conditions that at each top, the topmost edges are always directed upwards. Okay, that one can explain. And as I said, for every bulk vertex, two edges are directed inwards and two outwards. And it's not hard to show that these set of configurations is in bijection with the ASAS entry. Um, okay, and the bijection is not. Huh? Uh, uh, why should it be? Um, because we want the condition as you read, you start and terminate at the top, right? So somehow this condition of having a row sum one means that uh, you fix, that is fixed once and for all. If you let that free, then you do lose the bijection. You get many more configurations. So that forces that the row and column sums along that uh, trajectory is always one. And that ensures the bijection. So this ensures that what we are, if we can count these set of configurations, we have counted the set of DSS and triangles. We've counted the triangles that we want. Because of this bijection, it's straightforward bijection. So these, uh, whenever you see a vertex with uh, this kind of uh, configuration, two, the horizontal arrows pointing in, vertical arrows pointing out, that you replace by one. The other way around, you replace by minus one. All the other four, you replace by zero. And there's some special things at the boundary, which just add some technicalities, but it's not much. Okay. So for this, this particular example, I get this. Okay, it's probably, uh, I mean, uh, it's unreasonable for me to expect you to see it very quickly, but you see this one is like a, a one and uh, this one is like a zero. Okay, so uh, it, we, can, we can check it, but it's not, uh, it's not particularly illuminating. But the point is that at every vertex, the six vertex rule is satisfied, two incoming, two outgoing. And the boundary condition is what I said before. It's always possible to realize. 
uh, essentially there is the only possible obstructions could have been that the total inflow is the total outflow but we are not that restriction does not hold at the boundary you see so look at this there's no conservation on the boundaries for this vertex there are two outgoings uh, for this vertex there's one incoming one outgoing but not all vertices so you don't have any conservation law uh, because the only rule is conservation right incoming equals outgoing but that fails at the boundary so there's no there's no obstruction okay so now let me tell you what we how do we count this so we are going to give weights to this configuration and we are going to calculate the partition function so it's a statistical mechanics model uh, so we'll we are given these uh, spectral parameters u1 to un plus 1 never mind they are they're, what they are they are formal parameters and there's some extra parameter q associated to the left boundary we have these four weights again symbols alpha beta gamma delta and same on the right okay now for the jth path which goes like that like that like that starting from j you have this label uj for each of them and the for every vertex, we are going to give a label, which is the product of the, the spectral parameters that contain the vertex. So let's go slowly. So this green line is the third line. So it has associated to it the, the label U3. The, uh, for example, the fifth line has U5. Okay, but the third and the fifth line are going to meet. There, at that vertex, in fact, they're going to meet twice. And at those vertices, you give the weight u3 times u5, okay? So what's the upshot of this? At each vertex, I have some weight. I've given it in some complicated way, never mind what it is. But there is a weight. At the boundaries, I only have a single parameter, just by construction. Okay, so here's where all the complication is. So there are six possible bulk, config bulk uh, vertices. For each of them, I give a certain weight. If uh, there are two incoming on horizontal and two outgoing vertical or the other way around, I give weight one. Otherwise, I give some complicated function of the spectral parameter, of the parameter associated to that vertex. So just like this vertex has u3, u5, that's my u over here. Yeah? So, so associated to each vertex, I have some local configuration and I have the weight. So depending on what the local configuration is, I have a weight. Sigma of any of a sigma is this function, sigma of u is just u minus u bar, where u bar is just u inverse. It's just uh, to save ourselves some writing space. So for each of these bulk vertices, I have this complicated expressions. For the left boundary, I have even more complicated op things which involve the alpha, beta, gamma, delta. And similarly for the right boundary, Okay, why did I choose this? This is essentially because of integrability. And to make that point uh, even more, okay, so just to tell you how complicated this can be, the weight of a single configuration, that configuration that I had before, is this horrible expression, okay? Huh, so, so sorry. So I, I told you what the weight of a vertex is. What is the weight of a configuration? It's just a product of all the vertices of the, product of all the weights of the vertices. Yes, everything. So for this example, which was this example, this, this example, I have this horrible expression. Okay. But what does this buy me? I mean, I seem to be making my life more and more complicated. I just wanted to count the number of these guys. Now for each guy, I have this horrible expression. I have to, and now what I want to calculate is the partition function, which is the sum of all these guys over all possible configurations. Yes? Okay, so before I come to that, why did I choose these weights? So it turns out that these weights in the bulk satisfied something called the Young-Baxter equation. So what does it mean? So very abstractly, this is this equality. What does it mean? So, associated to, so you can see there are three vertices here with weights x, y, z. Q is this parameter that I had fixed once and for all. If x, y, z is Q squared, 
this equality holds. What does that mean? It means that to each of these edges, I assign all possible ways I can assign arrows, preserving the six vertex rule. So there are three vertices. This has four adjacent uh, edges. This has four adjacent edges. This has four adjacent edges. You assign arrows such that you preserve the six vertex rule. Calculate the weight of this local guy as the product of the weights of this times this times this for each of those. Sum them up. Do the same on the right hand side. You'll get the same answer. Yeah, so no, I, okay, sorry. I'm saying something wrong. So you fix the boundary a priori. This O1 to O6 are fixed and they're the same on both. So for any fixed O1 to O6, I sum over all possible internal configurations, I get the same exact answer. Huh, so for each vertex, I have a weight, you know? Just like I had U3, U5 in the example. So that I'm calling X for this vertex. That's Y for this vertex and Z for this vertex. And I assign the weights according to this rule. This is just a bulk rule. So this is called, yeah, so this is essentially the young baxter equation. So, and it only holds when you specialize in this particular way. So if you write this down component-wise, you'll see that there's a lot of, uh, there are a lot of equations that get satisfied and they get satisfied simultaneously. So there's some magic going on here, and of course, so that's the important part. Uh, okay, so this is in the bulk. So whenever I have three vertices which can connect this way, I, I can do this. Uh, I can do this transformation. So in uh, when you do, so if you remember when in high school and so on, when you solved circuits uh, by Kirchhoff's laws, there was also the star delta kind of transformation. So this is like one of those transformations. So you you can change things locally without affecting anything else. That's what the point is. Okay, so on the left boundary, you have something called the reflection equation. And again, uh, something special has to hold. Yes. Huh, no, no, right. So there is something that I need to do to reduce it to that. That's correct, which I'm not explaining for lack of time. But. Uh, <laughs> but I can I can show you how to get to those. So uh, the quick answer is I. So you see U4 and U5 like that. I will connect them up. I will I will uh, braid them together, and then I'll use the Young-Baxter equation to permute it to go through. So what the Young-Baxter equation allows me to do is to interchange U4 and U5, or any UI and UI plus one. So uh, I'm getting ahead of my story. I'll, I'll come to that in a second. So, on the, uh, so this is called the left reflection equation. So in the left, uh, you have only vertices with uh, valency two. That corresponds to U and V, and these are two bulk uh, vertices, X and Y, with valency four. Then you can transform it into V and U and this, this business, okay? And similarly on the right. And again, these happen only when these conditions are satisfied, not always. I have chosen my weight such that this is satisfied. Sorry, bar is one reciprocal. Yeah, just for uh, shorthand because the uh, formulas will get very messy. So the amazing thing about, so now I can tell you why I chose this complicated weights. Remember, I just wanted to count something. I put now these horrible weights. The point is that if I sum all of these guys, I get this partition function. The partition function is symmetric now. It's a symmetric function of u1 up to un. In other words, if I interchange any ui and uj, the function is independent of, I mean, does not change. The function is invariant. Okay? Uh, okay, so now let me come to the part about alternating sine triangles. So remember, uh, I had all these free parameters, alpha, beta, gamma, delta on the left and the right. If I choose them in some very special way, uh, and if I set all the UIs to be one, and I set Q to be the sixth root of unity, uh, rather, mm, yeah, sixth root of unity, 
then that particular guy has weight one, and all the boundary vertices also have weight one. So then, under that special condition, I am counting, because then the product of all these weights is just a product of ones, so I get a one per configuration, then I'm counting. So ultimately, that's what I want to do. I want to set all my UIs to be one, I want to set Q to E to the i pi by 6, and this I will fix now for, uh, for, all, for, my, for my computation. Yeah, so I want to evaluate this partition function, U1 to UN, and UN plus 1 is 1, at the sixth root of unity. So this is our main theorem. Uh, that this partition function is given by this, up to some product is given by a determinant. So that's... This is, this is related to what's called the isergen koropin determinant, which, uh, which comes up in, um, the in, in the literature on integrability. The point is that when you do all of this, you, get a, you can write it as a determinant of something. Once you can write it as a determinant, then you have tools available to help you simplify. And again, these formulas are quite horrible, so I, I don't want to dwell on them, except to say that there is a determinant. Okay. So these, these are the main ideas. To, we have to establish the young baxter uh, equation, the left-right equation. That will prove the symmetry. So now we have this complicated function of u1 up to un plus 1. What we want to show is that this determinant is essentially unique in the sense that it satisfies all the properties that the partition function satisfies. And uh, because it's a polynomial, blah, 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 you can, uh, you can just, uh, just by counting free parameters, you can, you can get uh, that this is unique, uh, simply because uh, if, you, if you have a polynomial of degree n, for example, you know that there are only n plus 1 free parameters. That's the kind of uh, argument that one uses. And one just proves that any property that the, the partition function satisfies, this determinant also satisfies, and so these two have to be the same because we have taken account of all parameters. So, so these are Laurent polynomials because we have reciprocals. So, uh, but uh, the ideas are the same. So, and then one has to show that the determinant satisfies. So, this is fairly standard procedure. It can be quite tedious. Okay. So, as a corollary, uh, when we set the last parameter to be p, we get some even simpler determinant. And uh, to actually come down, come back to our result, uh, we need to use uh, the theory of sure functions. So maybe in the interest of time, I shouldn't uh, tell you to, I shouldn't uh, maybe go through all the details. Uh, just very quickly, sure functions are a class of symmetric functions uh, that form a basis. There's a very important representation theory in geometry. Uh, and... Uh, so, uh, and their enumeration is, is very, very well known. So, one can compute, uh, so the number of, uh, so there's a determinantal formula for sure functions, and if you set all the parameters to be one, there's, there's a known, the known formula for them which, which one can use. So, essentially what we use is this following theorem of Oka, separately due to Okada and Stroganov, we say that our part, the partition function that we have is essentially up to some factors. The sure function of, okay, so I, I, I'm getting ahead of myself. So sure functions are indexed by partitions of integers. And this is the, these are, for us, what we get is sure functions corresponding to double staircase partition functions. So these are partitions that look like so. So, so this is n, so it's like n, n, n minus 1, n minus 1, etc., up to 2, 2, and then 1, 1, something like that. Okay? So these partitions naturally turn up in this business. And so, so, so that's what we get. In the last one minute, let me also tell you how we, that, I mean, the similar things hold for the quasi-alternating sign triangles. Again, we get a determinant formula, and uh, 
again we get the same double staircase kind of partition functions uh, partitions sorry except that it doesn't start with nn it starts with a single n and then when you specialize you get the number of cyclical asymmetric partitions. so the connection is via the short function so both of these objects the cyclically symmetric plane partitions and quasi alternating center angles they are both enumerated by this double staircase uh, kind of short function that's the that's the only way we know how to prove these things and lastly for the OSASMs you choose these parameters is the same story except now it's a little more complicated we don't get a determinant we get a product of two fafians so you, so uh, okay the strategy is very similar it's just uh, repetitive but uh, and here uh, here instead of sure functions you get what are called symplectic characters these are sure functions are relate are characters for the general linear group uh, these guys are sim characters for the symplectic group and uh, they appear naturally here and that's related to these guys yeah so I think I stopped at the right time thank you <laughs>